Okay, good evening. I'd like to call to order the June 18th City Council meeting of the City of Avalon. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for the invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Lord, please guide the decisions that are before us this evening. May everyone join me in a moment of silence. Uh, we recently lost Bob, Ma Bob Maestro, who was one of my long-time long -time mentors, uh, the founder of Dive and Surf in Redondo Beach, and the founder of Body Glove Wetsuits. Uh, he was a, a protector of the island and a major contributor to our ocean environment and the uh, effects of the, and actions of the conservancy. Amen. Amen. Huh? Thanks for that two harbors. I left two harbors out of that equation. You're welcome. Uh, announcements, Denise? Roll call. How about roll I'm sorry, call? How about roll call? Councilmember Hernandez? Here. Councilmember Morrow? Here. Councilmember Olson? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Ponce? Here. And Mayor Kennedy? Present. Oh, and I need, do, I need to make an announcement. Okay. That this governing, governing body will be holding two separate meetings this evening. Three. Three. Well, okay. <laughs> they will not be paid any extra money for each one of those meetings. Despite how hard we try, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Do you have any other announcements, Denise? No. Written communications? No. Council, any announcements or written communication? Announcement later. Announcement later. Okay, when we come back at 6, at, uh, six o'clock. Okay. Uh, Doug Federal. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Community. My name is Doug Federal. I'm the uh, Captain Avalon Sheriff Station. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you two relatively new station volunteers. Uh, they're residents of Palmdale, although they've lived all over the world. Um, They've been stationed or sheriff's department volunteers since 2000, so for the past 13 years. Past nine years, they've helped out at East LA Station, primarily working with one of our newer deputies, Mike Oriana. Uh, they've done uh, they've done things like set up nonprofit organizations and have done a lot with uh, youth activities league programs. Uh, one of the primary things we're going to be using them for, and they've already been doing it, is on uh, cruise ship Tuesdays, being down on Front Street, with meeting uh, the uh, the tourists that come over and uh, doing what they can to help code enforcement and our deputies enforce uh, some of the things on Front Street, like the other uh, golf carts and the, the bicycles and the pets and other, uh, other uh, Avalon municipal codes. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Danny and Donna Brooks. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come and be of service to this community. Uh, my wife and I have traveled to Avalon many times, and, uh, and we would like to uh, extend our services to the city of Avalon as well as to the Sheriff's Department. Uh, we've been volunteers for a long time, and hopefully uh, we'll be a, a volunteer or volunteers for a lot longer. So um, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to be of service to you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank welcome, you. welcome to the community. Welcome <laughs> to Avalon. Excellent. Okay, our intentions, uh, we have some, a few closed session items this evening. We're going to uh, adjourn to closed session for as long as, uh, well, until we can be back here at 6 o'clock so we can get to other business and then go back to closed session after that. So as the agenda is published, uh, do you want to announce any of the closed session items? Scott? Yeah, we have three closed session items. Number one, public employee performance evaluation, interim chief financial officer. We have conference of legal counsel regarding existing litigation or regarding uh, the uh, Falls Canyon Road site. Uh, and then lastly, we have conference of real property negotiators, 225 Metropole Avalon. Um, this is the property next to the museum such. We'll be discussing the price in terms of payment. Um, that's it. Okay. We'll try to see you back here as close to six as, as we can. So,
Okay, we've returned from closed session. We handled one of our three closed session items. Uh, would you care to report back, Scott? There were no report back on item number one. Okay. Our uh, next item is a presentation from CRNR. Welcome, David. Good evening, uh, Mayor and members of the Council. David Farian, uh, representing CRNR. I apologize, we had a glitch. We could not get our PowerPoint up. <laughs> so we're going old school. You should, in front of you, have a <laughs> hand, <laughs> uh, a copy of it. So I want to real quick, um, you know, thank you for the time tonight. We're going to spend a couple minutes just talking about our transition and talk a little bit about uh, our public education campaign that will be ongoing as we transition on July 1st. Uh, with me tonight is uh, Maria Lazarek. She's our uh, senior manager of our community relations department. And George Lazarek, a uh, vice president um, with our uh, governmental affairs. And Cheryl Allison is with us tonight, uh, currently with Republic, but soon to be uh, with CRNR. So uh, on the first page, I just want to spend a minute just uh, talking about, there's another item on your agenda tonight where we're asking for uh, the name of the company that will operate under to be a, a Avalon Environmental Services. So all of our signage that you're going to see around town will be um, providing that items approved on the consent calendar will be under Avalon Environmental Services. So this is our new logo. That's what you'll, uh, what you'll see running around town. Uh, transition update. I'm going to do that part of the presentation. I'll be very brief and then Maria's going to spend a little bit of time talking about our public education campaign. Um, as you know, we're scheduled for a July 1st transition. Uh, wanted to update you on our trucks and equipment. All of that is in our yard in Stanton and being prepared as we speak. Uh, the majority of it is ready to go. It's been painted, it's been signed, and uh, we'll be getting ready to ship that over to the island. So, and we're very pleased with the way that turned out. Um, our first uh, shipment begins on Wednesday the 26th. Uh, that's when the items, will, our first barge will be over here um, on the island. We have two scheduled. We anticipate we'll be able to get all the equipment on there. But in case we can't, we do have a res uh, third one reserved for Friday. Um, our equipment's going to be staged at the Field of Dreams. That's something we worked out with the city and the Catalina Island Company. And so we'll have things staged there uh, uh, to allow for an easy transition. Uh, the commercial bin delivery, which is uh, those businesses that have, uh, you know, they don't provide their own containers, the larger containers, um, will be delivering our containers the weekend of the 29th and the 30th. And uh, we're actually bringing a, a transition team over to handle that. Uh, all the employees have been offered employment uh, with CRNR, and we're finalizing some items relative to that. Uh, our HR manager will be over here on Friday uh, to finish that up. So we anticipate having that all buttoned up and ready to go. And I uh, just want to report that our transition team, uh, meaning those folks that don't currently work for the current company, we're bringing a team of people over. Uh, starting next Wednesday the 26th. So we will have additional people on the island to ensure that we get a smooth transition, we get our containers delivery, and if any issues come up, we have people here to deal with them. Um, and I'll be here a good majority of that time myself. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Maria, and she's going to walk you through the public education piece. Thank you, David. Good evening, everyone. So as David mentioned, our scheduled outreach will begin next week, June the 25th. Um, we intend to mail an announcement letter to all the residents and the businesses here in Avalon. Um, we also intend to post that letter, and I believe there's a copy of that for you. Um, post that on the uh, mailbox, the post office bulletin board, excuse me. Uh, the letter is going to emphasize that we've been working uh, diligently with Seagull Sanitation for a smooth transition process. The residents shouldn't feel any real major change other than different equipment, different colors, and uh, Avalon Environmental Services. Uh, website information will be included on that as well. They can go to our website and take a look at what their en enhanced service options are available to them, bulk item collection, temporary service collection as well. Uh, we've also included a copy of the actual service guide. Again, I apologize. We had intended for this to be public so that everyone could view that, and we had a little glitch tonight. Uh, we're also offering, as you're aware, an option for residents to subscribe to automated collection carts. They're hard carts with wheels and lids. We intend to mail a postcard with dimensions, information on that. 
Um, if they opt to elect to subscribe to this, they can return it in a postage paid postcard with their information, and we'll begin rolling those carts out August the 26th. Along with that cart, when we roll that out, we'll include additional information about uh, recycling, um, information that'll be beneficial to them as well um, regarding Avalon Environmental Services. We believe that outreach is ongoing. Um, you know, we intend to, again, work with, uh, uh, excuse me, Cheryl and Denise, and uh, be certain that you get the continued attention uh, to all of the outreach and, and uh, participation in community events that you've uh, been used to, and hopefully we'll surpass that as well. Any questions, please feel free. Mr. Mayor, just wanted to uh, come back up. I don't know if anyone has any questions, uh, anything they'd like to go over a little more in detail, um, anything I can answer at this time. Questions? I'm good. Rudy, come on up. I haven't seen any uh, presentations, so if I'm asking redundant questions, uh, just tell me to shut up. <laughs> uh, Rudy Pilch, 346 <laughs> Las Lomas. Uh, one thing I'd like to know is uh, under this uh, option, these are these rolling barrels and carts and so on, and uh, I assume there must be some kind of a fee schedule to that? Nope. No fee schedule? Marvelous. <laughs> Free is always good. Uh, is there going to be any difference in the recycling process? Uh, I mean, it, I don't know, you've, you've, you've probably seen the spec list that we have now uh, that identifies, you know, how to separate your refuse, the plastics and the metals and the bottles and Okay, so this this does do it. Huh? There's a separate can, Rudy, for it. So the blue bags, you put the blue bags inside the blue trash cans. Will will oh, this I, be going out to the to the residents? This <coughs> in the mail. In the mail, this the one that shows the different bins. Okay, because this shows you here what goes in the bins. Yeah, I see. Okay, good. That that's a good sign. Uh, is there, uh, are the fees going to be the same? Yes. Our residential fees? Yes. Yes, they are. Yes. Are on our, our no? Yes. No, there's no change. No, no change in fees. <laughs> there's no increase, Rudy. No increase. Yet. <laughs> Pessimist. And then how about the, uh, the annual one time a year, they were doing a large item pickup. Do you want to address that, David? Yeah, that's, that's even better. That even, that's included too, right? It is included. Actually, what you'll be what you're able to have now is what we call a bulky item collection. So at the point you have something that doesn't fit in your containers, you'll be able to call the office and schedule that at your convenience, and we'll send a truck out and pick it up. So again, you won't have to wait for the annual cleanup. It'll be what we call a bulky item cleanup, and it's on call, on demand. So if you have something that, let's say your refrigerator goes out, and you need to get rid of a refrigerator, you'll be able to call, and we'll come and pick that up. So you won't have to wait for the annual cleanup. Now, is that no extra fees? The annual cleanup that we have now is a no cost. This is no cost, up to three bulky items per year. Um, anything after that, would be there would be a charge for that. But. Anything else? Anyone else have a question? Okay, well, thank you, David. Thank you, and I apologize for the technical difficulties. <laughs> That's okay. We live on an island. We live on an island. We're used to it.
And Richard doesn't mind. <laughs> I think it's great, <laughs> But now. Well, well, now. Audra, remember we were waiting until we came back from close session? Yeah, we got a close session. Oh. Because yeah. you said it wouldn't be a problem because she was spending the night. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, no, that's okay. I was told that I'm good. Okay. 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 All right, we have two more items, uh, two more closed session items that we're going now to depart. Uh, we can get CRNR and their gang uh, back on the ferry. And uh, what do you anticipate our uh, our time being there, Scott? 25 minutes to 35 minutes. Some half hour, check Okay, so if we're late, it's his fault. <laughs> Okay, we've returned from closed session for our two remaining closed session items. Would you care to report back, Scott? No report back. Closed session. Okay, on to our second presentation this evening. Audra? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I would like to introduce Karen McBride, who is from RCAC. Um, the past few council meetings, we've been talking a lot about grants and trying to get a disadvantaged community designation to assist with our matches and other important things and Karen is uh, a resource that we're hoping to tap into in fact she's already kind of been helping us out so uh, Karen McBride okay hi Karen hi there the story of my life here <laughs> Oh, good evening, Mayor and Council. I want to thank you for the opportunity to present to you tonight and also the opportunity to come to Avalon. I travel a lot for rural communities and they're not as, of course, uh, as beautiful as Avalon. <laughs> but that's a whole other story. So, um, so we'll go ahead and move forward. I have a brief presentation. Uh, Rural Community Assistance Corporation, we, we commonly refer to as RCAC. Um, RCAC is a part of a national nonprofit organization. Uh, the bigger partnership, of course, is the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, six regions. RCAC represents the Western region, uh, which we actually provide technical assistance and training in 14 Western states. We recently uh, picked up Montana and North and South Dakota. So again, we do a lot of travel. Um, again, not to communities as beautiful as, as Avalon. Some of our programs include affordable housing. We have two divisions at RCC, one environmental and one housing division. Um, we provide affordable housing and technical assistance under our HUD grants. We uh, also work with communities in developing community facilities. That's more along the line of um, community development block grants and working with communities that might need a fire station or some type of a community um, improvement building. Water course and wastewater infrastructure, why we're here tonight, talk a little bit about the wastewater infrastructure. We do have a loan fund program. Um, a lot of times we provide a bridge loan to communities to help them get started on their project. And um, if the community, of course, has been awarded by a federal or a state contract or grant, then we get the repayment from them. So usually the bridge loan gets you started. We can turn bridge loans around in about seven days and get that to the community. We provide a whole um, array of classroom and online training. Um, a lot of our classroom and online training are, are geared towards maybe empowering boards in small communities and getting them educated on uh, boards, do's and don'ts, <coughs> and, and giving them a lot of education on how to conduct board build, build business. Uh, we do a lot of water and wastewater classroom and training also to get water operators uh, the education to continue on in getting a higher certification, the same with wastewater. Um, 
So a lot of the online training, of course, is very popular to communities that can't travel in or don't have a budget to travel in and actually uh, attend a classroom training. Technical assistance uh, is pretty much commonly what I provide. I have a wastewater background. A lot of times, technical assistance just ranges from going in and working with communities to find solutions um, for their water and wastewater problems. Uh, maybe the TA in, involves finding them funding. Maybe it's actually working with an operator. Um, maybe it's actually reviewing rates and giving our opinion if, if the rates need to be adjusted to, to take care of operation and maintenance or reserve fund accounts. Um, like I mentioned earlier, board training. So technical assistance is just pretty much short of engineering services. We don't provide any engineering services, but we do have several engineers uh, that we have on uh, employed uh, as well as water operators and wastewater operators. And of course, again, what we want to talk a little bit about tonight is conducting median household income surveys, which we refer to as MHIs. And I, I wanted to back up a minute before I go over the, what's been done so far. Uh, RCAC and, and, and part of the national partnership is our funding is from federal and state grants and contracts. Uh, RCAC being the biggest region of the six, we have about 110 private uh, contributors also. So we have a very good funding source that, that we're able to provide a lot of these services to, to communities. So what have we done so far is We've met with the ADRA and we've discussed Avalon's needs in the wastewater infrastructure and making the improvements there. Uh, we've also contacted, I contacted USDA Rural Development and also State Water Resources Control Board to let them know that we've been asked by the community of Avalon to have some help in trying to determine what we can find in funding to make these improvements. Um, we've evaluated also um, with Audra, but also with the funders, what the current or, uh, median household income is. Um, and I, I'm sure Audra has shared with you that everybody has different numbers. <laughs> so we're trying to determine, you know, how USDA came up with their set of numbers and, of course, the, the, the data they use. And then, of course, uh, the State Water Board in the numbers that they've come up with, unfortunately, positions Avalon to be about $208 shy of being classified as a disadvantaged community. And then, of course, a disadvantaged community is nothing more than just kind of a low income um, area under a statewide uh, median income. So what we're focusing on next, of course, is to continue to, um, to assist Avalon and through the process and, and try to, to come up with a plan B since we're still, again, that $208 uh, short. But um, also when we did contact USDA Rural Development, uh, according to their census data, Avalon is already disadvantaged for their program. So they came back and said that their criteria, their income status is anything below 50,000 and uh, they've, they've encouraged Avalon to move forward with conducting a, a pre-application. So I'll, I can work with Ardra on that and support Avalon in any way I can to pull that information together for the pre-app application. Usually when uh, rural development gets a pre-app and, and we really, RCAC does their best in really working with the funder and encourage them to um, entertain the community to go to a full application. So we'll work on the pre-app, hopefully get that over the hump and have them invite us to um, conduct the, the full application process. We'll, dis we'll continue uh, discussions uh, for eligibility uh, with the State Water Board. I was talking to Audra earlier, and um, of course, it, it's again a shame that we're only off by $208 for their program. 
but um, we got an email late last night on how, how they came up with the data, so I, I'd like to actually contact them when I get back to Sacramento and kind of sit down with them and kind of review what, what mythology they went through to, to determine we're still off by that amount. Um, and then we are still, of course, have the option of conducting a community-wide income survey. Um, it's a process uh, uh, by mail that we send out usually a, a notification letter to all the customers and let them know why the need is to conduct an income survey and if grant funding does come through, how that funding would be utilized to improve the wastewater system. So we're still exploring that. Um, again, the, the mailing happens twice. We usually mail it a survey, wait for a number of responses, and then do an additional second mailing and hopefully meet our target uh, based on the mailing. If, if we don't meet our target response needed for after the mailing to determine the MHI, then we actually come out and finish it door-to-door. Uh, -door. So again, uh, support and assist Avalon with funding applications, uh, any income surveys, and then anything that we can do, again, to support you on um, rate review or rate adjustments. And I, I don't want to put rate adjustments in there and alarm anybody. It's just, again, part of the process of how we can kind of support you uh, if we need to look at rates again, but I can I understand you're going through that process now. So, any questions at this time? Kind of where we're at. Where uh -huh. I have one. As the data is compiled for the income survey, in that process, do you also look at cost of living adjustments based on what it costs to live in this community versus another one? Is that part of the analysis at all? It is not, and that's a good question, and that's actually something that we ask the water board to consider, kind of a margin of error, um, you know, where the community is located, and again, that I guess didn't change numbers in their eyes, but um, the survey itself is pretty, pretty simple. Number of folks in the household, what was the reported annual income of prior year, and then they actually have to print their name and sign the form. Um, that information that's collected by us, we do the mailing, we collect it, and we don't share any household or individual information with, with even the funders. We just come back and say, Avalon came in at 49,000 or, or whatever the MHI comes in at. Okay. Any other questions? I just want to let you know that all the help to date has been free from RCAC, which is amazing to get these kind of resources and advocacy for nothing. So I'm very appreciative for Karen. If we do have to do the MHI, they'll come back with a proposal on what that costs. But I believe that all, a lot of the other stuff in there is just, yeah. And so I think that's really important to know that they've already started working for us and we haven't had to pay them anything, which is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, Audra has made it very easy to work with, with you. So she's given me a lot of good information. So. Excellent. Well, thank you, Karen, for the presentation. Anyone in the audience have any questions for Karen? Yeah, Rudy, come on up. Rudy, be gentle. <laughs> <laughs> That Karen's pretty smart. <laughs> <laughs> Very observant. No, just one simple question. Uh, I just wondered, if, does this all just only apply to capital improvement projects for the city, or I mean, grants? You're you're focusing on grants. We are focusing on grants. That's correct. The, the particular this project would just be in this pressure. So um, no. Very good. Thank you. Yes, that's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Rudy. Uh -huh. Okay. Oral communications. Anyone in the audience have anything on their mind they'd like to discuss with council that is not on our agenda?
Audra? They don't need to see anything. Not seeing anyone come forward. We'll give Audra a second to, oh. So Jen doesn't kill me. I have a couple of announcements I want to make early in the evening so we still have our audience. Uh, Thursday begins our week-long celebration of the Centennial of Avalon. And Thursday night, the kickoff is going to be a uh, Centennial Fest on Crescent. Food, games, historical displays, and music between 5 and 9. Friday, and don't panic, the fish fry is back, but this time it's going to be fish from the market. Actually, um, U.S. Foods is donating the fish, the corn on the cob, the uh, coleslaw, the plates, napkins, spoons, onion or not onions, lemons, everything. And um, so that's going to be free. It's going to be limited to the first 500 people to show up because we're going to have food for 500. And it's on Crescent Avenue between 6 and 8 p.m. And then on Saturday, we're going to have a street concert on Wrigley Stage. I don't have any other information as to who's going to be playing. And that's between 8 and 10. On Sunday, June 23rd, 8.30 to 10.30, Catalina Movies on the Beach. In front of the pavilion? On South Beach, I think. Yeah. South Beach? I think so. Yeah, in South Beach. Um, Monday, we have Pack a Picnic Night at the Joe Machado Ball Field from 5 to 10 is kind of an old countrywide picnic where they'll go up there and have three-legged uh, races and sack races and stuff like that, so that could be kind of fun. Tuesday night, June 25th, from 7 to 10 at uh, Wrigley Stage, we're going to have local band nights. We're going to have three or four of our local bands perform, which would be really cool. And the culmination is next Wednesday, the 26th, from 6 to 9. Actually, it's about 6 to 9.20. On Crescent Avenue, we're bringing a barbecue onto the main street between the pier and Wrigley Plaza. We can feed about 600 people there. There'll be hot dogs, burgers, um, chili, um, <laughs> coleslaw, I think. And we're going to have a centennial cake. And then it's going to be culminated at 9 o'clock with a fireworks show. At, uh, it's going to be that Wednesday, so that'll be kind of fun. So come celebrate Avalon's birthday. And then one other thing is British Soccer Camp is going to be in Avalon June 24th to June 28th. It's for kids 3 to 16, and uh, sign-ups are extended through this Monday. You can sign up at City Hall, or you can go online at cityofavalon.com and download the application. It sounds like a really cool thing. They did it last year, and it was a really well-attended camp. So, Jen, don't, look, don't kill me. Excellent. Thank you, Ollie. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, consent calendar, Denise. We have seven items on the consent calendar this evening. The first one is actions from the June 4th, 2013 City Council meeting. Second one is expenditures. We have warrants in the amount of $715,023.32, payroll in the amount of $186,040.41, for a total expenditure amount of $901,063.73. We have um, a resolution before you for a used oil recycling grant, and this is before you, I believe every year, Brian, or every three years? And then we received, the planning um, department received a letter from the California Coastal Commission asking us to adopt a resolution in support of increased funding for local coastal planning. Um, there is a First Amendment already to the franchise agreement, franchise and lease agreement with CRNR, which we entered into in March of this year. And there's two things on it, and one is for them to be able to use the name Avalon Environmental Services, as well as um, for the city to receive a franchise fee equal to 10%, correct, Scott? For charges that are not, that they don't normally we don't know we don't charge normally and they would be receiving the money um, the sixth item is a renewal of a service contract with pacific alliance which is Lori montgomery and she maintains an integrated uh, database for us uh, for direct assessment uh, tax bills as well as um, parcel data that she's always trying to keep current which is a challenge and then once a year she updates our vehicle permit program at City Hall, which helps us keep everybody hopefully in line. And then also she does stuff on the website as well as um, handles customer service. 
And then also uh, the voting delegate and alternates for the League of California Cities, which is, is in September in Sacramento. Currently, we have three council members that will be attending that, Mayor Pro Tem Michael Ponce, Council Member Ole Olson, and Council Member Ralph Morrow. So we're asking for you to appoint Mayor Pro Tem as the voting delegate and Ralph and Ole as the alternates. Okay, thank you, Denise. Uh, there's seven items on our consent calendar. Anyone in the audience care to discuss any of the seven items that are here before us? Uh, council? Rudy, oh, yes. Rudy, come on up. Uh, Rudy Pilch, 346 Las Lomas. Uh, would like to hear a little bit more about uh, the, the fire truck uh, before you take an action. That's on general business. That's it, yeah. That's our next one. That's, That's our next, next one. one. Yeah, item eight? Yeah. Yeah, item yeah. eight. Right. Isn't that on the consent calendar? No. no. Okay, good. Thank you. You're welcome, Rudy. Um, I have two, uh, two questions of staff regarding the consent calendar. First, um, I know that Lori's been doing, doing this uh, Pacific Alliance contract for some time. Has staff taken the time and identified anything that we need to improve or change in that process to make it uh, more effective? Have mm -hmm. we gone through that process at all? Do you have recommendations, Mayor? I'm sorry? Do you have recommendations? Uh, no, just identifying, you know, at, at one point in time when Charlie was here, he was trying to correlate this with the database and try to keep it with planning and have some of this stuff kind of be we are working on more communication between all the departments and Lori. Okay. If I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure what you're exactly asking. I, I haven't right. personally identified it, but we've been doing this long enough that we've, we've found some strengths within this process and we've probably identified some weaknesses. As long as we can identify with this agreement with her, the weaknesses that we have determined and address them, that would be my suggestion. If there has been it. Um, on the support of the Coastal Commission request for additional funding, through this recommendation, have they encouraged Sacramento any funding stream for this process, or they're just asking for more money and more support? <laughs> Has there been any drafted language as to where the governor is going to get this money, or is his design and resolve going to be increasing taxes or fees to the end user, the cities and or taxpayers. Asking for the legislature to increase the funding for the Coastal Commission as when the communities and Coastal Commission is more vigorously enforcing the requirement that the cities update their local coastal programs. So they're asking the legislature to give them more money. What I anticipate this is about is that the budget that was just passed and will be signed in the next eight days or so um, is based on a very conservative estimate in terms of revenues coming in. And that if the economy continues as it is, there will be another couple billion dollars to be distributed. I think the Coastal Commission wants its plans on that. Additional money before it's distributed. So the, the Coastal Commission and or its lobbyist is not forecasting where this money is going to come from. Just give me more money. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> Bob, Bob, there's another one, too. That this number four, this is a good example of how they get you, okay? <laughs> because if we say no, we go on that list, and the Coastal Commission staff remembers Avalon the next time we come in. Right? Roger that. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, of the seven items on consent, uh, anyone else on the council have any discussions of the seven items? Anyone care to entertain a motion then on the consent calendar? Move staff on one to seven. I second. Okay, call for a vote, please. Ralph, is, did you vote, Ralph? Uh, yeah. All eyes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, general business. <laughs> This item is the Avalon Fire Department has a fire engine that's being replaced soon. And I'll let Mike Craig come up and talk about it briefly. Mike Krug, Avalon Fire Department, 420 Avalon Canyon Road. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council, and staff. 
Uh, the issue before you tonight is uh, twofold. Uh, number one, declare the Avalon Fire Department 1999 Ford Type 5 engine, engine one surplus. And second, choose uh, a final destination for it when it's removed from service, uh, which I expect to be around July 15th. Uh, my recommendation is that the vehicle should leave the city of Avalon inventory and leave the island completely to avoid any further maintenance issues, costs, and or associated storage issues. Um, I've given uh, council several options. The first one being to continue to try and sell the vehicle. Uh, it has been listed with a fire apparatus dealer for over a month uh, with no interested parties. Uh, there's also an option to donate the vehicle to a mainland charity that sells the vehicle, then that charity that's designated receives the money. Uh, the vehicle has also been submitted to the California State Firefighters Association Surplus Equipment Program with no requests received. Uh, we, there's also an option to donate it to the Bomberos organization, and that's an organization that collects surplus equipment for firefighters in Mexico. Uh, they have also responded, or they have responded back with an interest in receiving the vehicle. And then lastly, there's an option to donate the vehicle to the Hawaii County Fire Department Station 17A in La Pahoehoe, Hawaii. And you should have an attached letter with your packet. Um, that letter is from Fire Chief Wayne Krug, which coincidentally is my father. <laughs> uh, he is the uh, Volunteer Division Fire Chief for Hawaii County. Uh, that being said, I'm obviously familiar with their department's needs, and that's why I'm presenting you with several options tonight. Um, I don't want to, I want to avoid any possible conflicts or any uh, accusations with regards to nepotism. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions in more detail about any of these options if you like, and I, I think Rudy has some questions as well. So if they don't get it, you get disinherited? <laughs> I want it to go away. If, if Hawaii County can use it, or someone else for that matter, I'd love to see someone get a, a, some use out of it before it's finally retired completely. It looks like nobody wants it. Hawaii, <laughs> Hawaii, Hawaii, wants, Hawaii, Hawaii, Hawaii wants it. Wants it. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, Mexico wants it. The, the, one of the reasons, or several of the reasons, that Hawaii County is interested in it is the, the particular station that they'd like to earmark it for is very rural. And while they do have several engines there, one of the challenges they have are dirt roads and bridges that their current engines exceed the weight limit. <laughs> so if, if the vehicle was to go to them, one of the things it could do for them is allow them an engine that could go across some of the bridges in their district um, without exceeding the maximum capacity of that bridge, which is obviously important. Rudy, you have a question on that item? <laughs> I can tell you that the company that called Brindle Mountain that listed the vehicle estimated it at $25,000. Um, that estimate seemed very high to me given the condition of the vehicle and with that being said we haven't received a single offer at that at that amount or anything less than that. So my my wishy-washy answer is the value of the vehicle is whatever somebody wants to pay for it and up to this point we haven't had any <laughs> interested parties. Potentially. I, I guess I'm, where I'm going with this comment is the fact that uh, obviously you're looking at a budget. Now you're looking about our next subject is going to be rate increases that are going to be added. And uh, if there is that kind of value, it seems to me it ought to stay with the community somehow. And I'll just give you a little testimony. About five years ago, I did go through a, a vehicle donation process with one of these organizations that takes it, uh, they market it, they sell it, and, uh, and then the, uh, the proceeds go to whatever uh, designated organization that you want, nonprofit. And it worked very well. It was, uh, I, I was impressed with it because it was very easy just to ship the vehicle over. They picked it up, they housed it, they advertised it, and finally sold it. And, uh, and then the, uh, 
the nonprofit received the, the, the funds. So anyhow, I think either the city needs to recapture that value, it seems to me, or we do have some nonprofit organizations in Avalon uh, that need extra funds, and they need it desperately. One of them particularly that I've been doing a little time with is the uh, Choices. Uh, but they're just, they're just one of several. I know they're all, they're all hurting for money. But uh, I, I would like to suggest that, that that value stay in Avalon. Thank you, Rudy. Rudy, Rudy you took my papers. <laughs> <laughs> Rudy's slick. Rudy's still slick. <laughs> Keep an eye on your paycheck, Mike. <laughs> Mike, it has been listed for sale. Pardon me? The truck has been listed for sale? Yes, it, and it's currently still listed. And we have no offers? Not so far. And the company that I listed it with, I, I actually uh, got, was recommended to me by the people that are building our current vehicle. And they have a vested interest in seeing it sell. They take 7% or $500, whichever is higher. So obviously they're car salesmen. And, they have a vested interest in seeing it sell at whatever value somebody's willing to pay for it um, so they can recoup their money. So we, we didn't pay anything up front to list it and have it listed on their website. So they do have a vested interest in seeing it sell. And then I just wanted to kind of touch on some of the comments that Rudy made. Um, regardless of what happens to the vehicle, whether it stays here or, or somebody wants to put time and money into refurbishing it, that's all well and good. But it, here it comes back again full circle just like we talked about almost a year ago about when we were talking about replacing this engine how much time and money does the city want to invest in a, a used car so and we've invested a lot in that truck it's, over the years it, and it's it served the department well it, right. it's it, it's in service every single day it, it gets a lot of use yep. it, it's because of its size it, it's uh it has a, a lot of value, and it, that's why it's on every call. It needs to go. Okay. Any uh, other discussion or recommendations? Well, maybe go to the charities and find out if somebody wants to take a shot at it. You know, just say, you know, raffle it off or whatever. The, the and then if all else fails, send it to Hawaii. The, the little bit of research I did about the charity organizations is essentially you pick which charity uh, you want to support, you ship them the vehicle, then they in turn turn around and sell it. And I'm not sure if they sell it for scrap, they try to sell it, would try to sell it as a fire engine whole, part it out. But ultimately it, comes, it becomes their problem, whatever they want to do with it, however they want to get the most money from it. So how much use is left in that vehicle? What do you think? <laughs> uh, it, not much. No. Uh, well, not much for us. I think one of the things that, that, that an organization like the Bomberos or Hawaii County can get out of it is that it's not going to be in service every single day, that it, it'll become kind of a specialized piece of equipment. And both organizations have a, a mechanic fleet, can, can invest some money and time in it, make it uh, try to prolong its life a little bit, and then use it sparingly. I, I think whether it was kept in service here or kept in service somewhere else, it, its days are numbered, yeah. certainly. It's, yeah. it's ran its course here, I, I feel. It's an old vehicle. I'd like to see it go to Hawaii, personally, myself. I think it might have a few good years still. Is that a, and if somebody could use it over there and make it work properly and make is that a, it good is that use a for firefighting, <laughs> is that a motion? Just, I would just say, I'm just saying that I, if they could get any use out of it, a little more life out of it, I'd love to see it if go there tonight. If that's the motion, I'll second. I would like to make a motion that we ship it up off to Hawaii. Yeah. And the shipping's uh, going to be covered by the receiving party? It will. They, they have uh, some sort of organization similar to some of the uh, relationships we have with the freight line that they have with Massive. the container people that ship stuff back and forth. So um, I have a letter. Well, the, the letter you have uh, spells out that they, they understand that any shipping costs to Hawaii are absorbed by them, that once it leaves the island, it's, it's theirs. 
Is this on the Big Island? Pardon me? Is it going to the Big Island? It is. It's going to the Big Island. Uh, if you're familiar with the Big Island, it's on the east coast of the Big Island, about 30 minutes outside of Hilo, and it's a little town called Lapahoyhoy yeah. um, that's very rural. You should go visit it. I like to go <laughs> in there with really. yeah. Ship it to Hawaii. You have to go visit? <laughs> You'll have to go visit your old truck, huh? Okay, is that a motion and a second? Yep. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, call for a vote, please. All eyes. Aloha. Mahalo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why don't we uh, move to the Avalon uh, Municipal Hospital Board of Trustees meeting. Roll call, Denise. Trustee Hernandez. Here. Trustee Morrow. Here. Trustee Olson. Here. Trustee Kennedy. Here. And Chairman Ponce. Here. Um, announcements? None. Written communications? Denise, any written Oh, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> uh, no presentations. Uh, oral communication. <laughs> it's easy for you to say. Oral communications. Anyone wishing to speak in regards to the hospital on something that is not on the agenda? Seeing no mass run to the microphone. Consent calendar. We have three items on the consent calendar. The first one is actions from the March 19th. 2013 um, hospital board meeting. Um, we have on the chief financial officer's report financial statements for February, March, and April. And then there was a letter from John Friel, the CEO of the hospital, mm -hmm. just updating or giving you information on the sewer replacement project and recommendation is just to receive and file the document. Anyone care to pull anything or discuss anything on the consent calendar? Just, I was just looking at the cost, the ballpark figure for the sewer replacement on that. Is Dennis, are you familiar with any of that with the replacement sewer for the, for the hospital? hospital. I, I just was looking at the, at the the estimated ballpark figure of the cost to fix that was what six hundred something thousand. Is that? I just reviewed it um, did about you? Uh, 30 minutes before oh. <laughs> the council meeting, and I haven't gotten into it, oh, okay. but I okay. did see the price. But does that price seem a little high, or is that it seem... It does, does to me, but I, I need to right. re review it to be sure. I was just thinking, if, I didn't know if there was anything from the city's part of it that we could figure out what we could use or what we might need. Or... Yeah. I know the inspections are done by state people from that do hospital, so our inspector really could only do so much, right? His hands that's are tied. That's correct. It's right. specialized. Okay. It's a whole, it's it's a a whole, whole different, different animal. Yeah. yeah, it's a whole different um, animal. That you have to get approvals for. Sure. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah, that means from, yeah. That's was my thing. Okay. Okay, thank you. Well, Rich, but I, I thought it was high, too. Well, yeah. Rich, I kind of agree with your sentiment. I mean, we entered into a slip lining project where we slip lined, you know, two thirds of the flats for a million and a half dollars right, right. and here we are talking about one building for 600 grand so um but I, the other issue on this is that they actually have to break through the floors sure. yeah they, i understand they're that. they're going through cement right so it, it's not like going out digging up the street it, they're actually no, i think it needs to be done there's yeah. no doubt about it i mean I, I i agree with it but but just in the in the wording of it, it was just a ballpark figure yeah. so it wasn't nothing in, nothing in concrete and Osposh can add so much cost to <laughs> um, Can I get a motion then on the consent calendar? So moved. One to three. Second. Call for a vote. All ayes. General business. There are three positions that are going to expire at the end of June of this year, and we put an ad out in the paper as properly noticed. The hospital board has made a recommendation of three applicants, Conrado Vega, Lisa Moss, and Beatrice Van Every. Open for discussion, anyone? Uh, no, I'll make a motion uh, to approve the three applicants. Appoint uh, Conrado Vega, uh, Lisa Moss, and Beatrice. Second. Call for a vote. Oh, 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 oh. Any oh, any discussion from <laughs> the audience? <laughs> Who was my second? I'm sorry. Well, okay. Call for a vote. All eyes. 
Uh, chair's report, I have nothing. Member's report? Then we're adjourned. We're adjourned. Okay, I'll call the city council meeting back to order. Uh, public hearing. Do you want to do the other public hearing first, the one on our special one? Oh. I'm sorry? Oh. And I no longer have an agenda sitting in front of me for the special meeting, so let's uh, call the special. Right here. Here. Thanks. He's got it. Okay, we'll call the uh, special meeting to order. Uh, it's a public hearing item regarding mooring fees and proposed increases. And do you want to review staff's recommendation on this? I'm sorry. Busy thinking of my notes. <laughs> I try to have Brian Bray come up and talk. <laughs> from, from memory, I believe that our intention was to open the public hearing and hold this item over uh, for staff to do further review. Is that correct? No? Isn't no. that what we discussed in closed session? No. No. Okay. All right. Scott, lead us through it. <laughs> Come on, guys. This is uh, improperly noticed and um, in today's papers for consideration of adjusting fees upward in the harbor. Um, Gray will provide the, the details. If the council were to approve this, the ordinance book code requires that you also prove that you approve it twice at another meeting. So this would be like an ordinance here. The ordinance book code imposes two hearings before you increase any fees. We'll be adjusting that next year to comply with state law. But tonight will be the first of two public hearings on the fee increase because these fees are not property, property related fees. In other words, um, you have to choose to go to the harbor and, and, and more there. It requires three votes. Um, the ones later tonight, because of property related fees, require four votes. For these fees, it's three votes to approve. So with that, Good evening. Uh, last time mooring fees were raised were in July of 2011, two years ago. I'm recommending a 5% increase across the board except for a new category. Uh, right now we have anything 39 feet and under. So a boat that's 39 foot is paying for the same thing that the guy on the 30 foot mooring is paying for. Uh, and I'm proposing to go to a, a new category of 31 to 39 feet, which fits on the 40 foot mooring. They would be paying a little bit extra other than the, what the 30 foot boat pays now and what they pay now. Uh, just to note that our fees are up to 36% less than what you pay at the Isthmus. Uh, currently, a boat 30 and under at the Isthmus pays $31, we're 28, I'm proposing 29. Uh, 31 to 39 feet, Navalon currently pays 28, the Isthmus pays 38, and I'm proposing 32. And then the rest of them are just all 5% increases. Uh, same with the shoulder rates, we have a winter rate where you pay for any two nights and you get five nights free. We'll continue that. And we have a shoulder rate which is off season from uh, when the winter rate ends until June 15th where you pay specific Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I'm proposing that we drop that and just have pay any four nights and get three free. And with the um, mooring owners and leases, we're also proposing a 5% increase on, on those fees also. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, this is a public uh, hearing, so anyone in the audience care to comment on this item? Rudy? 
<laughs> Good boy, Rudy. Uh, Rudy Phelps, 346 Las Lomas. I hadn't really intended on addressing the harbor piece, but I think that one thing that the city always has to remember when there's a comparison done between Avalon fees and Isthmus fees is that they pay a lot more fees for the use of their harbor than the city does. And that's why there is a disparity between the two. Are you all aware that they do pay uh, uh, Tidelands fees right. to the state of California? 25%? The city? No, the city owns their own Tidelands. Anyhow, I'm just, I just would like to caution that because I think every time we hear about uh, rate increases, uh, there's a comparison to the isthmus and they're not com they're not comparable. Thank you, Rudy. So Rudy, you were the harbor master of the isthmus, right? I was. <laughs> yes. Many, many years ago. <laughs> yeah. So you would know. I uh, I merely remember what <laughs> I mean even since my city council time uh, and also as a boat owner uh, spent quite a few times uh, addressing the, the harbor rates and I think there still needs to be caution about that yeah. uh, they're, they're a very good part of the community and uh, Yes, they are. We obviously have to provide something for them easily as we, as we do take. Okay, thank you, Rudy. Anyone in the, else in the audience care to comment? Okay, uh, discussion council? I have a question for Brian. Okay, we have a question for Brian. Brian, sure. yes. Um, at Two Harbors, if you come in in a 30-foot boat, all that's left is a 50-foot mooring, you can get that mooring for the price of the 50-foot mooring. Do we do that in Avalon? No. We charge by the boat size, not by the mooring size. I, I know that was a benefit to Two Harbors when they changed that policy a few years ago. Um, well, I think it would be kind of tough if the guy comes in and pays for two nights on that 50-foot mooring, and we need that 50-foot mooring the next day to uh, give to another boat that's bigger and we have to move them back to a 30-foot mooring and, and then we'd have to refund them and I think there'd be people saying, well, you're putting me on a bigger mooring because you want more money out of me. So no, you're putting on a bigger mooring because he wants the bigger mooring. It's the choice of the boat owner. That's some, something to think about. And um, I, I also know that in two harbors, the mooring fees include the maintenance of the mooring and in Avalon it doesn't. Now, that's on the mooring lease. On leases, but that's, that's figured into the daily rates too. Right. So, okay. Thanks, Brian. Anyone else have a question for Brian while he's up? Uh, any other discussion? No? Anyone care to entertain a motion then on this item? Did you close the public hearing? We'll close the public hearing. Anyone <laughs> care to entertain a motion on this item? Move staff. I'll second. Okay, call for a vote, please. What is that? Four ayes, Kennedy, Ponce, Hernandez, Olson, one no, Council Member Morrow. Okay. okay, we'll close the special meeting and go back to the public hearing item of the regular council agenda. This is the public hearing for the salt water and sewer rates to be increased. This is the second. We're going to break this down into two sections. So we're going to open and continue the public hearing. And then if to receive public comment and to acknowledge if we've had any written letters and protest. And we have received four and one, one for it. <laughs> um, we would have to, just for the record, Written protests would have to be 51%, and of the sewer customers, we would need to receive 621 letters of protest. Saltwater, 
we would need 523 letters of protest. So we're, it is for a 10% increase in the sewer rates and yearly that is $43.27 added to, this is for residential information, added to the property tax bill which is uh, $3.61 a month. For salt water it's a 15% increase and that is a total of $18.61 for the year which is $1.55 a month on the property tax. If you were to vote on this and we receive a four-fifths vote then it would the ordinance would pass. If you do adopt the ordinance we would go to the second phase which is opening um, another public hearing and it is regarding the, the report. Are you, are you winking at me, Scott? <laughs> uh, correct. There, there, are, there, there, are, there are two items. The first is, at the last meeting of the city council, you introduced in a way meeting of the ordinance that would set what the fees are. And you've done that. To make the fees effective, you have to adopt the ordinance. After you do that, then there's a separate action. And that separate action is to place the collection of these fees on the tax rolls. So there's two actions. First is That's two. what I said. Right. right. Well, <laughs> you're like, is that true? I'm no. saying yes. In a long sort of way. Yeah, yes. Long yes. <laughs> yes would have been good. It would be better if you guys sat together. You could beat each other up. <laughs> no. We're better this way. <laughs> Okay, so. Okay, this is a public uh, hearing item. Uh, the public hearing is open. Uh, anyone care to comment on uh, the saltwater and sewer proposed rate increases? It's time, Rudy. Okay, Rudy Phillips, 346 Las Lomas. Uh, I think the focus of my statement is that prior to the city council taking actions to add any fees to the uh, additional fees to be passed to the be passed on to the community, that uh, I feel that the city really needs a full disclosure on the current budget discussions. And I think what's happened here is that uh, the budget. I, I understand that the budget is in process and that what there's going to be a final hearing or final meeting regarding the status of the budget on next week. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, I think what the city needs to do, or at least that what I would encourage them to do, is that before they decide that they have to increase fees, that they need to scrutinize the budget very carefully, which I'm sure you've done already, but I think there's a need for additional scrutiny. And there's some good precedence for that, because I do understand that, uh, say, the council, uh, you're, you're in a budget crunch right now just because you've lost a lot of revenue as it relates to the ACIA. And, uh, but I think there's a, there's a precedence here that actually occurred many years ago that uh, might cause you to think maybe uh, a second time about that. And that was in 1981. Uh, we had a crisis on the city council. Uh, I mean, in the city, not just on the city council, <laughs> but it caused a crisis on the city council. But it had to do with the, uh, uh, the fact that the city lost a significant amount of budget money as a result of Prop 13. And at that time, I think we lost, it must have been upwards of about 40%, maybe close to 50% of the revenue. And so that was very critical. We had just passed a budget, and uh, <clears throat> when that was finally uh, declared, and uh, the, uh, even at that time, anyhow, they're, they're facing the, you're, you're facing the same critical decision that has to be made that was made back at that time. But the council at that time, we had a very strong mayor, very strong mayor, very fair mayor, somebody that uh, I think uh, 
uh, needs a lot of credit even in today's centennial, in the current centennial. That's Bud Smith, was the mayor at that time. And uh, this is Denise's dad. And, and uh, he was a marvelous guy. He made some great contributions to the city of Avalon. And, uh, but anyhow, to, uh, to kind of further set that centennial stage, all of the activity that took place at that time did not take place in a magnificent stadium like you have now. <laughs> it was the old city hall. Mm. And uh, Richard, I think, remembers the fire station in that old city hall, too. Uh, and then the, the other person that was involved at that time was Charlie Wagner. Charlie Wagner was the city manager at that time. He was the youngest city manager in the state of California. And, but he helped bring us through that crisis. And uh, so I know that you've got, got a lot of good help with the budget and, uh, uh, and looking through it. But I, the, I think the, the crux of what the, that message is is that we actually did cut the city budget 50%. And one of the things that always stands out in my mind is that we had just raised the city council salaries from $32.50 to $32.64, dollars to double it actually, $64. I don't know what the city council is. I haven't seen a budget uh, lately, but I don't know what the city council gets now. However, there was a, uh, uh, an article in the paper just, what, about 10 days ago that disclosed uh, some salaries in the city. And I think from the little bit of discussion that I've had around the community, I think that there is a perception out there that uh, they need to be looked at. I mean, the entire budget needs to be looked yeah. at again. Uh, there may be some concern about these comments, but uh, as I say, that president in 81, uh, the fact that we walked in, we did, we cut the budget 50% and then we sat down and, and really massaged that uh, until we got through it. But the, uh, there, there is a need to be more cautious than maybe we are. It's possible that uh, I'm sure that there were a lot of comparisons made, and I don't want to dwell on the, the salary portion of it, but I have to believe that when it happens in salaries, it's happening throughout the budget. It's not just confined to the salaries themselves. And that's why I really uh, emphasize the notion of, of looking at the budget again or more carefully before additional fees are added. I think the community deserves that. I think as we all know, uh, everything is becoming more expensive. The only thing that I've seen any stability to really, frankly, is bonds. And a lot of people complain about bonds. It's not very big. But they, uh, they seem to have managed to maintain a pricing system there that just doesn't go out of the world, you know, out of, uh, out of sight. So I would, uh, I would certainly recommend that. I know that the, the salary issue and, and other things of that nature aren't going to be solved here. But one thing I do recall from my council experience is that typically, historically, cities have a tendency to compare their city with other so-called comparable cities. And there's not many cities that are comparable to Avalon. But what I do think is that maybe working a little bit out of the box, I think that uh, Avalon's, the character of Avalon and the, and the salaries that are paid in Avalon uh, possibly need to be looked at and even compared with positions in the city uh, and look at that as a possible comparable. Either the city of Avalon or uh, and I think working with the chamber, uh, that's doable. And, and or looking at other comparable waterside communities uh, up and down the California coast. But the notion of comparing it to other cities, I think is not, uh, not the right thing to do. 
Uh, Gina, uh, would you mind coming up and uh, sharing with Rudy and the community um, our forecasted deficit in, the, in these two funds and, and how the recommendation came forward to us as a result of uh, strictly the fees? And while you're coming up, Rudy, I'm going to assure you we're having a bu budget study session tomorrow, and we are doing exactly that. We're crossing the I's, dotting the T's, and doing what we can to produce not only a balanced budget, but uh, forecasting something that will uh, give us some stability, um, as well as adjusting some of the things that we've identified as uh, big government or wasteful spending. And, and Rudy, one of the things that outgrows of Prop 13 and the GAN limit was the enterprise funds, so that the sewer fund and the saltwater fund are enter enterprise funds, they can't make money. They can recover their costs. And even now, <clears throat> with these proposed um, fee increases, both those funds are going to be about $100,000 short, and they're going to have to take it out of reserve. So, I mean, I think we've done a pretty good job of scrubbing it and making sure that these increases are nominal but needed. And the, the cease and desist order is the thing that's really grinding down on us from the um, water board. But I'm sorry, Gina. <clears throat> Gina Shukart, interim uh, CFO. And uh, what I'll repeat is what I mentioned before. There, we are currently finalizing those budgets, and it has shifted. But um, I'll repeat what I said the last time um, and give you a little insight on, on the future. In regards to the sewer fund, this particular rate increase at 10% will generate um, an additional $132,000. Total net estimated revenue is 1.45 million. The reserves that we have for capital improvements in reserves are $277,000 in the sewer. The wastewater treatment plant replacement project has about 1.1 million. These are all estimates still. Operating reserves are $958,000. Um, saltwater is the one that has shifted. And uh, revenue generated from this rate increase at 15% will be 51,000. Total estimated, new estimated revenue would, would be $392,000. Our operating reserves at, are at $490,000. And salt water reserves are at $114,000. Um, the shift is we're seeing higher expenditures as a result of um, our contractor coming in, higher expenditures in terms of repairing the salt water valves. And um, I'll be, I can have that discussion with you tomorrow as well, or in the future at our next meeting to go into more detail into that. Um, so that's the estimate at this point. Saltwater's taking a little bit more of a hit. Right. Super. Thank you, Gina. Sure. And I just, I just, with respect to the cease and desist order, there are requirements that the state of California has placed on the Avalon to develop programs for. Um, that would result in cleaner uh, pay water. And we're estimating that this program is bigger, right? Um, to be $750,000 a year. And one of the things that can happen with non compliance with the cease and desist order is that, uh, one, we can get fined, and uh, two, what the state has not done, um, but they have the ability to do, we violate the cease and is to stop all the In other words, the state could come in and say, if you're not doing what we yeah. required you to do, no more homes, no more new restaurants, no more new businesses, period. And so we have escaped that so far. We've been able to negotiate with them. But that is a, a potential out there for them if they don't like kind of um, pressing with respect to cleaning up the uh, and the state is looking at us, trying to see what we're doing. And if we, if we ignore showing that we're trying to raise more money to help the situation, that might go negative against us. We have to file reports right. at least every year. Um, this 
city has not devoted enough resources to its sewer system. Yeah. And, and that's why I um, say this in place is cease and desist. And in reality, it's very difficult to go to a granting agency and ask for help when you haven't tried to look from within to try to raise the money to do the appropriate repairs and, you know, the, the ballpark estimate to fix the rest of the collection system is up there and it's an ongoing battle. I mean, we're, we're still pouring salt water down our infrastructure, you know, very corrosive thing. Okay, this is a public hearing item. Anyone else in the audience care to comment on this item? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Um, Any comments? I have a comment. Yeah. yeah. Um, in regards to the system to cease order, we definitely have to keep our eye on that. But Rudy, you brought up Char Charlie Wagner. Um, this is the same proposal he brought to this council last year that we did not approve. So I think we really need to get this done. Yeah. <laughs> Any yeah. other comments? This, yeah. No, no, we have to do this. Yeah. Have, normally I vote no, but not on this one. Because we have to show the state that we are going in the right direction and we're increasing funds because we need them, because we're probably going to go to them and, and probably try to get grants to help us do the rest. So we're just showing that we're doing as much as we can do by making these increases. Yeah. Is, is that your motion, Ralph? Yeah. That's I think Rudy had something to, one more thing to say. Rudy. Rudy, next time sit in the front row. Just, just one, one final question. What have we been doing? I've, I've come to the council meetings. I've watched them on the, on, the, on the telly at home. What have we been doing for the last 10 or 20 years? What is it, 15 years now since we received the first notice that uh, there was some contamination in the harbor? What, what, I, what I can tell you what we've done, I can only tell you what we've done the last four years. The last four years, the city spent about $5 million of redevelopment money um, on the sewer. And, and we entered into those contracts to spend that $5 million before the cease and desist order. And what the state looked at is, okay, good analog, you're spending this money, you've entered into contracts, we will consider that when we looked at the cease and desist, and they didn't find us, and they didn't stop developing. Right. So we started improving these uh, the infrastructure before the cease and desist, and they still stopped the cease and desist on us because they said, you haven't done enough. So, well, what does that tell you? We've, the city has spent a lot of money trying to solve a problem. Nobody's really watching the store, though. I mean, what, what, what have they accomplished? Well, at, at the end of the day, besides our besides spending money. Well, at the end of the day, Rudy, it, it, we have had some result, in, uh, improved results. You know, our bay water postings are reduced. Um, the biology reports that uh, were given have improved. Um, are we 100% out of the out of the trouble zone? No, uh, because we have a lot more money to spend. And we continue the, to find things. I mean, yeah. we found we have, the manhole on, on the way out to the mole, <clears throat> that a high tide would come in and would leach stuff into the ocean. We found uh, some sewers down by the via casino that were non-existent. Well, and like for example, we videotaped and found that the collection system that goes down Casino Way was in good shape and in, in serviceable condition. The next time we videotaped it, we found some defects within that sewer line. So it's an ongoing management solution that we need to define, run, and, and, and manage. Uh, that's frankly what's going on now. Uh, what has happened in the, in the preceding 20 years, uh, not much had happened. Um, and the reality is, is that you know, we, at one stage of the game, we were blaming the seagulls and the pigeons as our, as our problem, despite what the, what the scientific data was telling us. Um, so we're actually making great strides in trying to solve our bay water quality issues. And we believe we're spending money wisely and prudently, um, hence the comment on what, what the anticipated cost of the hospital uh, sewer collection system is. Uh, so um, we're trying to be good stewards to the environment as well as stewards to the resources that our taxpayers are paying. And uh, unfortunately, the, 
the uh, funding streams from the variety of sources that we've had at our disposal in the past have dried up. So now we're trying to do it through rate increases and through prudent management. No. We've only been posted at once and the rest of the city is clear. Yeah. So what we what we hope to have is that keeps up at the end of the year through the summer is that Avalon will be the we have made more progress than any other community in the United States in terms of cleaning up this water. If 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 the current testing results continue. And that's that's something that Objectively speaking, we can look at in terms of not only have we have the city council allocated this money and spent it, but we actually have objective results that are very pleasing to the city. Uh, and very pleased with the dramatic improvement in the last three months. We're so pleased that you have a cease and desist the order. Cease and desist order goes for years. Thanks, Rudy. Thanks, Rudy. Okay, we had a motion. I'll second. Okay, call for a vote, please. What are we voting for? Uh, oh, that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. eyes. I'll make a motion to place those fees on. You have to open. Uh, don't we have to do the public hearing yes. first? Oh, let's so open the public hearing. <laughs> As results of fees being associated with the tax rolls. Public hearing is open. You want to comment on that, Rudy? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not picking on you. I appreciate somebody in the audience participating. Yeah, the only uh, Rudy built 346 Las Lomas. I, I think uh, that's an issue that I think came up some time ago and was proposed. Uh, I don't think it was ever implemented, but I think one of the issues that was discussed that I recall was the fact that if there are any errors in any of the, the, uh, the billings, uh, the placement on the, on the rolls, that it uh, was become, it, because, the, because they're not right here in the city, that uh, and this is a county, uh, I understand the county assessor's office will then apply those, uh, those fees. That uh, you probably are going to have to end up going over and protesting uh, any kind of change that, that you feel that you're just, you know, there's a just change. And uh, so anyhow, it, the, the whole process isn't quite as simple as it is if the city uh, bills but uh, I can understand the, uh, the help it, it provides the city in terms of uh, making it much more easy for their accounting department. And also more economical. And hopefully more economical. Yes. Hey, Rudy, there's, there, I'll give you one indicator. Um, when this first came up, Bud was, Bud was the mayor. And what they did is they slip lined everything, or the, not everything, but they slip lined a lot uh, of the um, infrastructure. And then when I came on, we assumed that everything that was slip lined was okay. So we, can, we concentrated on other areas. Then when Charlie, when I came back, Charlie had gone in there with the CATV camera and found that some of the slip line stuff wasn't done right. So that, that's another issue. And just recently, there was a sewer found right there, just a little bit, right, like almost right in front of the Avalon Grill that we didn't even know we had. 
That's probably when you were in there. You probably put that in. So, yeah. Anyway, a lot of things that went wrong. And we're fixing them one at a time. And it's going to take a little more time to get it done, too. The smoke testing, in fact, in fact, uh, the city shut down the yacht club about a couple of days ago for leaking uh, into the bay. That was, so, that was their own... Yeah, but it was, that, it was leaking the in the bay, which, which causes uh, high, the high uh, numbers when they test. So, yeah, there was a whole bunch of things that we did. We sort of shotgunned a little bit. We tried to get Heal the Bay to change their levels. You know, these levels are bad. And then we went to San Diego, and Mission Bay uh, was under the same, had the same problem that we did. And they went in and they, they uh, did a $3 million study and came up with, a, came up with those levels that Heal the Bay set were not bad and and so yeah but that never they have more more horsepower than we do does the city still have a capital improvement uh, person engineer or somebody on the staff similar to a keep the fever i mean that that is directly responsible for contractors coming in doing work as it relates to the sewer yes dennis and he, he just walked out of, the, out of the room a few minutes ago. Uh, but he's been very proactive in our sewer management plan and, and how we've been strategically attacking our problem. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Rudy. Thank you, Rudy. Okay, anyone else care to comment on this item? Okay, uh, we'll close the public hearing. Recommendations? Motions? Comments? Re recommendation is to adopt the reports, direct the city clerk to file said report with the Los Angeles County Auditor, and request the auditor to place the fiscal year 2013 2014 property related fees on the tax roll. So moved. Second. Call for a vote, please. All ayes. All ayes. City manager's report. <laughs> I don't have anything. Get at it, girl. Okay. Scott? I have nothing. Not Richard? Richard. No, Denise, question for you. Uh, there's been a couple of people who came up and asked about people slashing tires, breaking off mirrors. Have you heard anything to that effect, or has the Sheriff Department been aware of I that? I did. I got a call a couple days ago regarding that, and I have not talked to Doug about it. Okay. Fact, when I saw him today, I forgot to. So. Okay. It's been I, good. I've I guess heard that as well as um, cars that are being left open. People are people going, going through them and looking for cell phones and etc. Yeah. So. It's yeah. been ongoing for. This is the so. time. So yeah. I'm just wondering that's if that's anybody else, because they're slashing tires and breaking, they're getting that's pretty. That's vandalism. I, I just received the one call, yeah. and I. No. You know, I, I, mis I was assuming I, it wasn't just hearsay. Yeah, and I'm hearing it's not little kids either, it's teenagers. So, just that anybody's watching, we will just keep your eyes with, open. Yeah. yeah, we have a wee tip number in Avalon too, that you can report things anonymously. I just forgot what the number was, so. <laughs> we do have a... Yeah, well, there's, a, there's a wee tip number. Yeah. Well, the 911, they know who it is. But there's another number you can call and leave stuff on a re re recorder that they don't know who it is. An anonymous retail. Good. Anything else, Rich? No, I'm good with that. Michael? Just a couple of things. Um, are you going to bring parking at Lover's Cove to us? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I just wanted to report back from my visit to Sacramento. Um, I sit on the community services and the tax and rev policy committees with the league. Um, community services was an excellent presentation from three gentlemen, uh, one a council member from West Sacramento, one a councilman from Sacramento, the other being a former councilman and now a nonprofit uh, director in Richmond. Um, and what they were, they were focusing on was taking care of, not to, of, of, of getting kids before they became gang related 
getting involved in gangs. They wanted to, to, to get them before they started to join gangs. Um, and they had some really great programs. I, I think the one I really liked the most was um, in Sacramento, this one councilman got a project going using one teacher from, Sa uh, from Sacramento Unified School District teaching 20 kids. And these 20 kids came and interned at City Hall. Um, they were taken out of Oak Park, which is a really bad neighborhood in Sacramento, and brought downtown. And the program, they were each assigned to either a council person or a department head. And at the end of the, at the, end of the summer, they got a $250 stipend. Um, they're starting the third year of this program. The second year of this program, they were able to bring in 40 kids and two teachers. Now this year, they're doing 60 kids with three teachers. Um, but when, he, when, when the gentleman who put the program together knew that it was working, is he had a security person at City Hall in Sacramento come up to him and say, Councilman, I need to talk to you. And he went, oh no, here it comes. <laughs> Um, he pulled him aside and he asked, are these your kids? And he said, yes, this is, this is my program. And he said, I just want to commend you on, on how well behaved these kids are, how courteous they are to everybody who they talk to. They, they were just blown away. And now they're looking at trying to increase the program. And when they talk to the kids, um, they said, you know, if we didn't offer the stipend, would you, would you still come? And they said, Yes, when we first talk about it, it's the money at the end of the summer, but no, if you can get more kids involved and you can use that money to pay for teachers to do this class, then no, we, we would highly recommend you get rid of the stipend. But it's just, the discussion was, whenever they talk about public safety and cutting in public safety, the programs that usually go first are the ones that deal with kids. We will maintain funding for a police officer, a fireman, or whatever. But the ones you need to get are the ones, you need to get the kids while they're still young and focus on them. And you need to teach them that they need to go back and be the spokesperson in, in their peer group to move it on. So it, just, it, it, it was just a very interesting um, subject that we were talking about. And then the, the, there is a one woman who's going to put a toolkit together that will go out to all the cities that will be able to do with the league website um, and get ideas to, to bring back to our communities. Um, the, big, the big issue facing five of the community, the policy committees was immigration reform. Um, the task force sent nine recommendations that they had gotten from the National League of Cities and they were all unanimous, unanimous, unanimously passed um, in support so that the league now has nine points of immigration reform that they would like to see. So. Thank you, Michael. Anything else? Nope. Bully? Once again, the Centennial Party starting Thursday <laughs> through next Wednesday. Grand finale next Wednesday, week from Wednesday. Burgers and dogs on the beach, Crescent Avenue between the pier and the plaza. Fireworks and birthday cake. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lee. Ralph? I got one. I've got one notice. It's very important. We had to cancel Miss Pat's celebration of life that was supposed to happen on the 29th of this month. Uh, we're going to do it in August. We just just had too many issues that we had to deal with, and uh, so we want to make this right. Uh, we uh, we want to do a big event, and it might be somewhere around selling raffle tickets and having a. A, a big fundraiser and divide the money up uh, amongst all the charities in Avalon. And so we want, it's, since we, we've been pressed, we, we, have, we, we have a memorial mass uh, and get together at Sacred Heart Convent in Montebello Saturday. And uh, that's going to be basically for the, for the family. We're going to take pictures and videos and all that so that when we have the celebration of a life, we'll show everybody what went on uh, there uh, in Montebello. But it, there was just too many things going on. Uh, and there was some issues with, with uh, my son having to get, a, get an ablation operation and then having it canceled. And, and it just, we just wasted a lot of time. So um, 
It's been canceled uh, as of now, and it will, it will end up happening in August sometime, probably right in the middle of August, and we'll keep everybody appraised of that. We're sorry that we had to, had to uh, cancel it, but we just, I want to do it right, because there's only one time we're going to do it. So uh, that's it. Okay. Thank you. We're adjourned. Cool.